face to face. And that is a hope. That is the hope of every Christian, or should be the hope of every Christian. Every day that goes by that we see this world becoming more and more corrupt. Every day that goes by that we see more chaos, more destruction, more death, more corruption. There should be a yearning in us that desires that which the Father has promised us, a heavenly abode, a place where we will finally experience peace, a place where there will no longer be government corruption because the Him that will lead us will be the Prince of Peace who will execute perfect justice. There should be a groaning in our hearts, brothers and sisters. One of the things that we read about Abraham is that Abraham wasn't just looking for the promised land. He wasn't looking for a place where he can settle and build a city, build a town, a place that he can call his own. The Bible says that he was looking for a, a city whose maker was God. He was looking for a place that was established by God. And that is our desire. And that's why we have to be careful, especially now during this election cycle, that we understand where our focus on is, is supposed to be on. That our hope is not coming from a man because if that is where our hope lays, we will be greatly disappointed. The Bible says, curse is the man who trusts in man. Man will never be able to save us. Man cannot redeem himself. We have to look to God, to his promises, not to have hope. And here, the Apostle John says, he who has this hope, this hope of being transformed, this heavenly hope, this, this hope in the things that are above, not in the things that perish, he says, purifieth himself purifieth himself. Now, this word pure, purity, and purify, they can be interpreted in several ways. First of all, there's the purity in the sense of moral perfection. And then there's also purity in the sense of free of mixture. Free of mixture. You see, brothers and sisters, Often when we think about purity, we only connect it to moral perfection and we miss out the part of mixture, free of mixture. You see, when uh, we speak about things that are pure, you could say gold is pure or, or pure silver or, or pure precious metals but you can also say pure toxins, pure poison, concentrations of those things. And I believe the main thing that is being emphasized here is not that moral perfection, but specifically that distancing from the mixture of the world. In fact, look look at what Peter tells us in 1 Peter one twenty two. He says, Seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love or sincere love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Now, first of all, purity comes from obedience to the truth. Purity comes from obedience to the truth. Purity in the essence of which a Christian should be, should be a heart that is devoted to God. A pure heart is a heart that is genuinely devoted to God, that it doesn't have a mixture for the world, that that God is just another number on their list, but it is a heart seeking to love God with heart, with all our hearts, all our minds, all our soul, and all our strength. In fact, that is the most important commandment, that we love God 
with all our devotion. And brothers and sisters, that is the 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 main attack or one of the main attacks of the enemy is to get us to divide our devotion, to live our lives for a career or to live our lives for anything else that is worthless, to divide our hearts and our desires so that we will become useless because the Bible tells us that a double-minded man will not prosper. In fact, look at, let's see what what James says exactly. He says, draw nigh to God, draw near to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. As we draw closer to God, as we draw near to him, as we seek after him, then our devotion starts to become unmixed. He t- he begins to take greater place in our lives. And through the Spirit of God, as we get closer to Him, then the consequence of that, then the effects of that, is that we begin to walk towards moral perfection. You see, no one that that first does not develop an intimate life with Christ, with God, will not have power to overcome sin. You can be all religious. You can be, you can move out to the desert. But without a devotion to Christ, the appearance of the outward may seem to have moral perfection or may seem to have moral success. But the heart is still filthy. The heart is still filthy. And Jesus tells us that as we get closer to God, he says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So as we draw closer to Christ, we become free from the mixture of the world. We start to get moral strength in that we begin to do what is right. And as our hearts become pure, we're able to see God. We're able to see him in our lives. We're able to see what he's doing. We're able to have, we're able to receive revelation from God. But this aspect of relationship is so important. The reason why a lot of times we fail in our Christian walk is because we're not walking in intimacy. And yeah, we can go for for a little bit and we can we can do it for, for a little while, but eventually our strength will become depleted and we will shrivel up unless we abide in Jesus. A pure heart is a heart that is genuinely devoted to Christ. Amen. Now, in order to describe what this hope is, we need to look at starting at verse 2. It says, Dear Beloved, now are we the sons of God, but yet it is not made manifest what we shall be. And we know that when he shall be made manifest, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Every man that has this hope in him purges himself even as he is pure. I want to look at something very careful here. The first thing that it says here is we will be like him. What happens when God receives us as children? We become engrafted. We become an adopted child of God. Now, one of the things that many people that adopt children would be able to understand that these children come from other families, and when they come into our homes, they start adapting to the way that we are. And a child will become that they will carry a trait of the family. 
you know, you could actually see a, you, you could actually tell when a child is a child of, the, of a certain family by the way that they may speak. There's some that you may be able to tell because the way that they walk. Others by the way that they express themselves. But here we see that um, when we come to Jesus Christ, when we become his children, there's something that we adopt. There's something that we receive from the Father. Now, what hope is there that we are looking for here? What hope is it that is talking about? It's talking about the hope of the restoration, the hope of reuniting with the Father. And what are we supposed to resemble? What is the, the resemblance that we as children of God are supposed to have? His purity and his likeness. Brothers and sisters, that's why this is so important. That's why, you know, uh, a lot of people don't understand. It's not just about saying that we're Christians here, you know, and just declaring words out. And then we go to our jobs, we go to the streets, and then people see something different. You could tell that you, you could tell that because, you know, sometimes the Holy Spirit will tug at you because, you know, you're doing something which is not in accordance to your father. And you'll feel like guilty that you, that you're acting a certain way or doing something that you shouldn't be doing. Listen, I don't know about you, but I know about me. I have to check myself constantly because when we leave our home, when we leave, when we leave our church and we go out into the world or the way we deal with our spouses, the way we deal with our co-workers, or the way we deal with our friends, is that the way that Jesus will deal with them? So this is what it's talking about. We, we, There's a transformation that needs to happen, brothers and sisters. It's not just a transformation that we say with words. People need to see Christ in us. People are not going to believe what you, you're saying, they're gonna, not going to follow a person that doesn't walk what he talks. Because if you look at the world, most of the world are pointing fingers and condemning the Christians. And why is that happening, brothers and sisters? It's because a lot of us are acting one way, saying one thing and doing another. So we need to get back to what God called us to be, ambassadors for him representatives of his in this earth and representatives aren't wild people that are going to clubs and doing the wrong things one thing that jesus did when he came to this earth he came to represent god and he represented him well and if god has chosen you then you need to represent him as well the right way not leading people to hell by leading people to him. And one of the things that we see here is that there is a cause and effect. There is a human responsibility that comes from that which we are given. A person who looks and hopes in Christ will desire to be like him. And this is what I believe Brother Lewis was speaking about, this transformation is that there should be this desire to change one of the things that we see about John is that often a lot of these hyper grace movements use the Apostle John to, you know, sort of show that, hey, you don't have to worry about your the responsibility that we have as men and women with regards to our action because we're under grace. And these are movements that distort the Word of God. But we see that grace itself produces something in us. It should change our appetites. It should have a cause in us a desire to be like Jesus because he is pure. One of the Old Testament examples that we see is the Nazarite. I believe that God put in the vow of the Nazarite in the scriptures not for us to try to emulate it, not for us to try to um, get into the ritual of of not eating grapes and but I, as a symbol.